Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 79 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, and before I introduce the guest, I just have a couple of uh, things that I want to say. So, first of all, this is really exciting. I try really hard not to gloat about the what some might call success. I'm using air quotes, success of Nostalgia Talk. But the last episode uh, with Peter Linz broke my record for fastest audience ever. 1,000 views in a solid week. Now, again, I try hard not to toot my own horn about Nostalgia Talk, but I was actually really amazed by that. So I want to thank you guys for listening to that. And uh, Peter, I told Peter, and he thanks you all as well. Um, I also do have some sad news. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I learned that my friend Shannon Doy passed away. Shannon was somebody that I uh, went to junior high and high school with. I wouldn't say we were like best friends, but we had a good friendship and I do value that. We hung out. My sister played soccer with her. Uh, Shannon and I first met at a talent show in junior high. She was singing. I was doing a skit with a puppet. And uh, we became friends after that. Last time I saw her would have been around the time that I was in college. And I went out with some of my college friends and I ran into Shannon while we were out. And I introduced everyone. And I felt really happy to be introducing my new friends to someone from my past. Shannon was very popular among her peers and she made it known how much she loved them. And, you know, I, I again, Shannon and I weren't like best friends, but she definitely was somebody who was never far from my mind and um we had a good friendship and i'll i'll always value that um so moving on from that joining me for episode number 79 of nostalgia talk one away from the big eight zero is michael bell hey well let me ask you a question you're a young guy shannon was young yes mm -hmm, yeah we were very close in age how, how old was he uh i think i i think i'm about nine months older than her Oh, how sad. Very sad. Yeah, it was... A it's kid. Just, You're a baby. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a real uh, tragedy. And so, uh, I think I, I think of her every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I got friends I'm losing <laughs> every day because we're all up there in our 70s and 80s. I'm in my 80s and we're all in our 70s and 80s. And, oh, my God. So uh, each day is... Uh, is, uh, is In fact, I get up in the morning, I get out of bed and I go, nailed it! <laughs> that's uh that's a good attitude just keep your head up oh yeah absolutely now, now for anybody who doesn't know michael is a voice actor who is well known for his roles as grouchy smurf and lazy smurf among others on the smurfs cracker quacker jack i almost said cracker jack but quacker jack on darkwing duck uh drew pickles and charles finster senior on rugrats and various characters on transformers and gi joe so michael it is a pleasure to have you on the show today uh, this is cool. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. And those are those. That's not me. I don't have a bad cough. Those are my dogs. Ah, uh, I didn't even hear anything. <laughs> didn't hear. Oh, 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 okay. Now, now I hear. Now I hear the barking. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, so let's talk, go ahead. talk to so, me. Yeah. So let's begin with. Um, how did you become interested in acting? Like acting in general. How does anybody? I don't know. There's. You, you have a, I guess there are people that say I'm going to grow up to be a. I mean, I, I've met I've met youngsters in in through distant family, and I say, well, "What what's your plan?" You know, I always ask kids, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And someone say, "I want to be a proctologist." Well, that's interesting. You're all of twelve years old, and you want to be a proctologist? Oh boy! When I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor from the time I was five years old. I mean, I can't imagine being anything else. So I think you uh, I think you get kind of um, I, I don't know, you imprinted, something happens. I didn't come from an acting family, so uh, I just wanted to do that. So that's that was my beginnings. I wanted it really badly. And family and friends would say, uh, well, what happened, you know, if I, by the time I was in my teens, if you don't become an actor, I said, well, then I'll die. That was how I felt. I wow. Just, yeah, yeah. So did you do, I, I talked to uh, a lot of people uh, who are voice actors who have done school plays growing up. Did you ever do school plays? Yeah. Oh, I did school plays. And I went to the High School of Performing Arts in Manhattan, where um, um, I'm still friends with many of those many of those kids who are not kids anymore. And a lot of them went on to having a wonderful career. And thankfully, uh, 
uh, I was fortunate enough to do the same. But yeah, I uh, always did plays theater. Even when I came out to Hollywood, I, I did plays long before I you know, started to really work. Yeah. So what was your first ever professional acting gig? Because as I was researching for this, I saw that before voice acting, you did a lot of screen acting parts. Do you remember the first one that you ever did? It just goes back. I'm trying to remember the first thing I got paid for. Okay. Uh, I did a terrible movie called Damaged Goods, where mm -hmm. I get where I get syphilis. Um, which is, it's just it's an underground film now, and it it it's a terrible film. I think it was done in sixteen millimeter, and I got a hundred dollars a week, and we went on location some really scorched earth area out here in California to film it and it's 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 really an underground film and I am as goofy tall lanky goofy guy named Monk and I wind up getting the, the the scourge at the end of it and then I play the doctor who talks about it having gotten it when I was a kid it's just the silliest thing and then uh I did some tv uh, did a thing called The Verdict is Yours, which you, you, they don't even have a record of. I mean, it was it was a good television show. I made some bucks. And then uh, I think I, I went into the service after that and then oh. came out and started to work. Yeah. Hmm. So how did you become introduced to voice acting? You know, it's uh, it's kind of it's all it's all connected. Um, I eventually was fortunate enough to get under contract to Universal Studios and played a lot of bad guys on uh, in 70s television. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met a, a woman who was uh, one of the top voice ladies in the business. And I just loved that stuff. I loved playing characters, which I didn't get a chance to do on camera. Even though I was guest starring on television, I was always playing the same thing over and over again. And uh, um, I, uh, uh, she said, why don't you audition for my agent and I did she put together a tape for me and he said I think you got something and sent me out and I started to work and I think if you have any older um, subscribers to your show um, one of the one of the big things that sort of got me going was a, a television commercial called uh, for Parquet and I'd go butter Parquet and it was a huge smash hit and I was doing television appearances and all kinds of stuff, doing talk shows because it was such a smash hit. And that kind of helped me going. That's amazing. So do you remember the first ever time that you did voice acting from there? That, you know, in terms of animation, I guess it would be Hanna-Barbera. It would be uh, Oliver Twist in The Artful Dodger. And I did uh, um, Dodger. And interestingly enough, uh, he was a Cockney, and he had to sing, both of which I'm not and I don't. And uh, and I managed to beat out uh, uh, the late Davy Jones from The Monkees. Oh, wow. He did sing and was indeed English. So, so I was being watched over, thankfully. That was nice. Hmm. So what was it like talking about Hanna-Barbera cartoons? Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you got to do Grouchy Smurf and Lazy Smurf, among others, in the original Smurfs cartoon. What was that like? It was great. I did Handy, Lazy, and Grouchy. And in the last season, um, Paul Winchell, who was uh, Gargamel, um, decided he didn't want to do it anymore. So I was always playing around with the voice and they asked me if I would do it. And I said, yeah. So I wound up doing, you know, and I did a lot of guest roles. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you do it uh, in those days, when you did, and now still, when you do animation, um, you are signed for one major role and you owe them two other roles. Right. Uh, uh, Katie Lee was a past guest on this show and she told, and Pat Fraley as well. And they both told me that your contract allowed three characters. Right. At that point, we went on strike eventually to say, you got to pay us for at least the third character. And eventually they paid a, a stipend for the third character. But yeah, because one of the things they want to do is they want to save money. And so if you are a guest, you would play your role and then you would play the beggar or the uh, the evil wizard or whatever it was that came along or so or the leprechaun, et cetera. And uh, it was fun. It was it was it was well, it was, uh, I mean, there's nothing like it today, I don't think.
Mm. I'm glad you brought up Paul Winchell. And for any of the listeners who don't know, Paul Winchell, uh, he was a comedian, ventriloquist, and voice actor. Uh, he was most well known for his uh, ventriloquist dummies, uh, Knucklehead Smith and Jerry Mahoney, as well as doing the original voice of Tigger in Winnie the Pooh. You know, the wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger the wonderful thing. The top that that's all Paul Winchell, and was also the voice of Gargamel in the, in uh, the Smurfs, the original Gargamel before Hank Azaria in the live action films. Uh, what was Paul Winch? And also, I should mention this: Paul Winchell invented the artificial heart. I was Which, just going to say that, yeah. Yeah, and so, and no, nobody believes me when I tell them that. They're like, there's no way the artificial heart was invented by Tigger and Gargamel. And I'm like, yeah, it was. He invented the artificial heart. And he and I had discussions over because I'm an animal activist. And I said, well, you worked on a cow. That must have been that's a terrible thing to do. He said, well, you know, all for the greater good, blah, blah, blah. And eventually, he, um, he said it, he was angry because he said it was... Uh, the uh, Pennsylvania University took the uh, credit for it when, in fact, he was the one that did all the work on it. Mm -hmm. He gave it to them, but he they took the credit. They never gave him any credit for it at all, and it was his all his work. But he was a super guy, really interesting, a real pro, um, and uh, also a very talented daughter. April Richard did voices. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. very talented girl. And you would know all that because you had a puppet when you were in school. So you would know about it. And when I grew up, Paul Winchell was the guy. I mean, I even had a Jerry Mahoney doll. I wish I had it now. I could buy an island if I sold it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul Winchell was like the puppet guy before Jim Henson was. That's right. Oh, way before. Oh, my God. Yeah, but was... but of course, Jim really did. Uh, I, talk, I talk to people who've worked with Jim all the time, and they've often said that Jim really changed television puppetry because if you watch, like, Paul Winchell's shows, he's got his uh, characters with him, of course, and he's usually just kind of holding on to them because that, uh, mm -hmm. creates the realistic effect that he's sure. like their father. But with sure. Jim Henson, you know, like obviously he would want it to make, to look a little bit more realistic. So well, yeah, television was changed radically. They didn't have what they had in the way of digital and, and things of that nature and the kind of elements they could use later on. I mean, look at what's going on now. It's mm -hmm. just extraordinary. Puppet, forget puppet. I love puppets. I think they're great fun. I wrote a, a script, uh, about a sock puppet that didn't know he was a sock puppet. <laughs> I love that. That's that's funny. I had no idea what that. He kept looking down. He said, "What is that?" You know, and it was there's a man, man attached to me. It's a man attached. It's very, 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 very a, a pretty cute script. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that was that was my period, uh, and that went on from there, which is nice. I've, I've been fortunate. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to be a part of Transformers? Because like you were in the uh, the original Transformers series, is that correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, what was that uh, like? There were, there were, oh, that was, well, there were so many of us, you know, we all crammed into one room. There must have been about 20 or 30 of us crammed into a room. All of us doing separate voices, different voices, there for eight hours in a room, working on the, uh, working on it. And it was, it was, it was work and it was great fun. It was uh, it was it was equivalent to one of our one of the guys in there who did a lot of radio said it was equivalent to his days of radio. When you oh just wow! Went one job to another, you went from one job to another, and that's what we did. We were doing that, and then that's something in Hanna Barbera. Then rushed back to do GI Joe, then off to do uh, in humanoids, and then running back to do uh, uh, Plastic Man or something. You know, it was it was I was busy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you also got to work with legends like Peter Cullen and Frank Welker, a lot of those guys who uh, reprised their roles for the Michael Bay live action um, Transformers. Were you invited to come back for those movies ever? No. Okay. No, I wasn't. In fact, I, I spoke to the executive producer, to the assistant producer who was on a radio show talking about them when they were first planning it. And I suggested that... Uh, uh, when I called him, he said, wow, Michael Bell, I'm such a fan, blah, 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 blah. And I said, great. I'd love to be able to do something. And he said, well, we're not doing Prowl or uh, any of your other characters. I said, oh, okay. I, I said, but may I make a suggestion? You know, rest his soul, Jack Angel was still alive at the time. And I said, myself, and there's Dan Gilberson and Frank at that time hadn't wasn't doing it at that time. And Peter wasn't doing it at that time. I don't know what plans they had. But uh, I said, why don't you just bring us, I know all the guys, why don't you bring us all in as extras on camera? I said, "We, I could be the old dude sitting on a bench going, what the hell is that, you know? And then <laughs> somebody else can be uh, 
the newspaper guy and somebody in the car saying, whoa, look at that, you know, et cetera. And then in the list of credits, you'd see, you know, actors and they'd, have, they'd list the people that had lines at the very least. And it'd be fun for the uh, fans. And he said, no. And I said, okay, just a suggestion. <laughs> Yeah. Ouch. So did you see the Transformers films at all? Nope. Okay. Nope. I'm not. <laughs> no, that's the enemy camp. I'm not interested. Oh, the trans original Transformer. Yeah, the, the the animated version. Yeah, sure. I saw that. But I didn't see that for like 30 years later. Okay. I never saw it originally. Mm -hmm. Everybody always told me that when the, when the fans come up at <clears throat> excuse me, at Comic Con, they'll say, uh, Remember when you said no? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that 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 seems to be something that happens with um, you know, people like voice actors and actors, and it's like, do you remember? And here's the crazy thing is that they do so many of these projects, and then they have to move on to the next project after that one. So they're not going to have time to remember one line because they got to work. Well, they, when I'm signing uh, photographs at, at the cons. They said, could you sign the line that Prowl said? I said, no, stop right there. Do you remember what Prowl said? They go, yeah. I said, good. Tell me what it is. <laughs> so what was it like to do the animated Transformers movie? Was it any different than doing the show? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. So like when uh, doing a movie is like, you know, because it's a little bit longer. Like, did it did it feel longer to put together than an episode of the show would? No, you just did your part. You okay, just did your piece, and they cobble it all together. We didn't even work with each other when we did the movie. We all worked separately. Mm -hmm. We went into studio and worked separately. I didn't see anybody else at the time. Okay, yeah. So you got to be the voices of a lot of the adult characters on Rugrats, uh, with, uh, such as the ones I mentioned in the intro, Drew Pickles and Charles Finster Sr. How did you get to do that? They called me, like mm -hmm. anything else in this town. You know, the agent said they're auditioning. Do you want to go in? I said, yeah, sure. And uh, they, uh, they said, this is uh, the character of, uh, I think I think it might have been Drew Pickles first. Uh, Drew Pickles first and did his voice. And they said, oh, great. And I was doing the show. And they said, um, we're interested in you reading for uh, Chucky's dad, which has because you have this character. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, what does Chucky sound like? Because I didn't know at that point, you know, we just were going to start. It hadn't happened yet. And they played uh, Christine Rester, so Kavanaugh, <laughs> with that little sound and everything. The nasal kind of thing. And I said, Oh, that's great. I'm going to do that. And they said, Really? And I said, Yeah, because he would have inherited from his father. You know, they have the same illness. They should both have the same um, adenoid problem. So I'm, I'll do the same thing. I sound exactly like Chucky. And that's what I did. And that's how it worked. And then they said, We have a, a grandfather coming in, a Jewish grandpa. I said, Oh, good. I'll, let me do that. Because I wound up doing that. And so I wound up doing these three major roles, which was fun. That's great, and it's cool that you got to do a a lot of the a lot of those adult characters, like not just one, but quite a few of them. Uh, actually, one of my past guests on this show was Phil Proctor, who right. was another one of the adult characters on Rugrats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also I was um, because I did so many voices. Jack Riley rested, so uh, didn't do any voices. Um, the fellow who played the dad, I get his name, Tony, the grandfather. He didn't do any. Voice. Are you talking about Grandpa Lou? Yeah, I think it was Joe Alasky. No, prior to Joe. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I can't. Joe. Okay, so I, because I, I knew Joe before he passed away, so I, I'm yeah. trying to think who it could have been. Joe did voices. No, uh, he. I'm trying to think of his name, and it's really terrible of me, but it's so long ago. I'll, uh, I'll look. I'll look it up. He was um, on the original Charlie's Angels. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the. Uh, the, the boss in Charlie's Angels. Not not Charlie, but Charlie's Charlie's Angels. Mm -hmm. uh, looking up the actor now. Uh, and his brother's very famous too. His both both he and his brother were very famous actors. What's his name? David Doyle? 
David Doyle. There you got it. It was David Doyle. And David eventually passed as well. But David, and David didn't do any voices. So every time we had a guest, if I had one character or two characters to do, I could do a third character. So mm -hmm. I wound up doing guests. One of my favorite guests was a character on Mr. Mucklehoney. <laughs> he's, I think uh, he goes, he's uh, interested in, in Drew's uh, invention. And they go to dinner. And Mr. Muckle does, he just does nothing but laugh. Every time, every time the kid does something, he would do something. He'd go, oh, <laughs> boy, that is great. You are really something, Pickles. <laughs> and it was just, I, it was just so much fun to play that character. That's great. Were you invited to be a part of the reboot on Paramount Plus? Oh, sore spot. No. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Know. No, sore spot. No, not at all. In fact, they got three guys playing the roles that I did. In other words, I did all three. They had to hire separate actors to play those roles. I said, you're Ooh. spending three times the amount of money. I'm here. No, we decided to go with some names. So they went with some celebrity names. I said, okay, that's that's the biz. What are you going to do? That's mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to voice Quacker Jack in one of my favorite shows from when I was a kid? I loved Rugrats, but it's only just recently that I started rewatching it. And there's some of it that is looking familiar to me. Uh, like there's things I remember from it. it like when I, I met Tara Strong a couple of years ago and I said to her that when I grew up, when I was like very, very little, like single digit little, I, I uh, knew I wanted to be either a Rugrat or a Powerpuff Girl. And she was one of the Powerpuff Girls as ah, well. I know. Oh, it's funny. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Uh, yeah, um, I, you know, it was a whole different world, I think, then than it is now. Or it may not be. I don't know. I, don't, I just don't do it. I basically am doing uh, dubbing. I'm dubbing for Netflix. I dub foreign films. Oh, that's just, great. Just finished another game. I do a lot of video games. Cool. So that's, uh, that's really it truth but you wanted to know something specific i'm sure what, what was it you wanted yeah i i uh lost my train of thought there but i was going to ask you uh what was it like to voice quacker jack in darkwing duck well we were all lined up and none of us really read for the roles they oh. just called us in they just knew who we were and said okay mike you're reading quacker jack and i think dan um uh dan castanetta you'd castanetta you're doing this character and you're doing that. And we just sort of looked at a drawing and tried to come up with something. And I had something in my head that I wanted to do. And I looked at it, I said, oh yeah, I want to do this kind of, you know, this kind of sound over here. And I went, and then Dan, whose voice, whose character spoke before mine, did that voice. <laughs> is that for Megavolt? Yeah. And I thought, oh, which is, which is sort of a, a hyper Kirk Douglas, the actor. You know, Kirk Douglas went, oh, he spoke with a crack in his voice. So he wound up doing that. I thought, where am I going to go with this? I have to, I have a lot, my line is coming up in, a, in another half of a page and I hadn't come up with the character because I, I was going to do that. Because we all sort of like know things we want to do that we can, that we can uh, call upon. So um, I wound up doing just this hysterical, <laughs> <laughs> you know that kind of thing uh, that would be fun because he's sort of nutty and mm -hmm. uh banana mr banana whatever and uh and they bought it they said yeah it's gonna be like that it's okay that's great mm -hmm. that's how cracker jack came about and in both rugrats and uh darkwing duck you got to work with and you brought her up earlier the uh late great christine cavanaugh yeah. uh and if any of the uh listeners don't know who christine cavanaugh was she was the voice of the original babe. voice. Huh? Babe. Yeah, Babe. That's right. In the film, I forgot about that. She did She did Babe. Um, mm -hmm. As well as Goslin in Darkwing Duck and mm -hmm. Chucky on um, Rugrats and also the original Dexter on Dexter's Laboratory. Right. What was, what was she like? She was a real country girl. Okay. You know, she was just down home, country girl. How you doing, everybody? You know, just real down home, real like Midwestern, I guess. And I'm an I'm an animal activist and a vegetarian. Okay. So I would kid her. I'd always talk about you know she was a farm girl. Then she did Big, which was a huge success. And oh yeah. Big, and we know what that was about. That was about pigs being dragged off to be slaughtered for bacon and whatever. It was a beautiful film. 
I said, has that changed your attitude? She said, no, I'm a farm girl, Mark. You know, pigs meant to be eaten. I thought, wow, and you just did this gorgeous character who literally to some degree changed the whole concept of people who went, oh, God, I'm not going to eat pigs anymore. I'm not going to eat bacon or pork anymore. Not her, not the gal did the more. She didn't get damn. She can go out there and eat it. <laughs> it uh, you know, sad. It's it's uh, funny that uh, uh, that 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 film, uh, you know, kind of changed the. Well, rather that you asked her, are you gonna are you gonna stop eating meat? A um, couple of years ago, my I have a best friend who lives in another country. She is studying at University of Edinburgh. She's taking veterinary medicine. And mm -hmm. just before her first year, she came here to Nova Scotia. Her family's from here, so that's how I met her. And um, I remember uh, we had ordered wings, and my sister was um, was there, and she asked Sean, that's my best friend's name, so with you studying to become a vet, do you think you'll ever become a vegetarian? And I looked at Sean and I'm like, oh, my sister's dropping the mic over here. And Sean's response was, well, you need a little bit of protein. Oh, but she's wrong because I get plenty of protein. I've been I've been um, vegan for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 50 years. Oh, wow. And still got the same size waist. I mean, thank God, tremendous health, at least during this program. And uh I get tons of protein from beans and vegetables, certain vegetables, tons of vegetables have protein. That's that's an old wives tale that you need meat for protein for human beings. We don't have the teeth for it. And we don't have the intestine for it. Like our, our intestines can go for, go for days. A tiger's intestine is maybe three feet at the most. That's why I can get you know the food through it, the meat through it. Our intestines curl up. Have you ever seen those terrible movies? Horror movies always pulling out somebody's intestine. It gives you it's a cord. You can climb down a building with the damn thing. You're not supposed to be eating meat. Nah, she was. She doesn't get it. Oh, there, there, there we, there we go. You heard it here first. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you heard, but you heard it here first. Mm -hmm. So you recently got to do the role of Quacker Jack again in the Ducktales reboot. What was that like? Well, they didn't expect me to be able to do it. Oh, wow. Yeah, they called up because, you know, I'm an older dude. And they figured things have changed. I said, guys, you know, my ass is dropped, but my voice is pretty much the same. So, and they said, oh, okay, we got it. And I went in and they went, whoa. And I said, yeah, I did it. It's cool. Don't worry about it. I'm there. You know, Nailed it. Nailed it. You mm -hmm. got it. Uh, it's funny. I was talking to uh, Justin Shankaro. Do you know Justin? Very well. We were on the board together at Screen Actors Guild. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and of course, he was on Hey Arnold, and mm -hmm. I asked him about doing the Hey Arnold uh, uh, movie, the Jungle movie, a couple of years back. And um, he said that he actually had to re-audition for Harold because maybe some of them, their voice had changed as they got older. So that's what I thought of when you were saying that well, they I, almost didn't use you. They uh, <clears throat> A couple of years ago, there's a um, a situation comedy called Community. So I yep. like that. Yep, I and love Community. You loved it. So they called my agent. And they said, "In it, the lead will get hit in the head, and he'll go into uh, GI Joe land. So it'll be all animated." I don't know if you saw that particular episode. It's worth watching. Okay. And it's called GI Jim or GI John or GI Jim. They were the characters' names. And they said, and we want to use a Michael Bell for the voice of Duke, because Duke will be in this in his world when he when he's in a coma. Mm -hmm. And they said, but you know, he's older now, so does he still sound the same? And so my agent called me and she said, uh, they're gonna call you. So do you want to do this? And I said, sure. And he said, So the the director's gonna call you and he wants to know if you sound the same. So I said, okay. So I waited by the phone, phone rang, I picked it up, I went, Hello. And he said, uh, yeah. And I said, uh, hello? And he said, yeah, is uh, Michael Bell there? I said, oh, sure. Grandpa? And then I got on the phone and I went, hello? And he went, uh, yeah, Michael Bell. Went, yeah, this is Michael. And he went, uh, Michael Bell, the voice of Duke? Yeah, what do you want? And there was a silence. I said, okay, knowing is half the battle. You right? You okay with that? He went, okay, good. Got it. And they called me in and I wound up doing it. 
Oh, that, that's funny. Um, that actually sounded a lot like um, Grandpa Lou on Rugrats. No, no. <laughs> so what was it like to be a part of G.I. Joe? Well, I was in the service, so it was fun for me to come back and play those guys, you know, do that again. Um, it was it was packed with a lot of talented people. We had a lot of talent, just the same, almost the same people that did Transformers. Mm -hmm. same people we all knew each other and uh and you know when you're a voice actor at least then i don't know about now because now you have to audition for somebody walks by and passes wind i mean you now have to send in auditions and then it was they just called us in and said we know what you do just do it and so they trusted us so they would give us a a, a drawing a prototype and mm -hmm. we would pick characters then when we were doing it they say okay you come back the next week and they say, oh, Mike, you're going to be playing, you know, this guy. And I went, okay, what, what, am I, what am I doing for him? I'm Duke, I'm Major Blood. I'm already playing Zaymok. I got to find something to do, whatever, lift ticket or something. So I said, okay, so I'll just, you know, we go back here and maybe, you know, voice back here somewhere or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, back out voice, you know, use something over there and, um, you know, maybe, you know, someone just talks like that, you know. We'd have to just come up with new sounds because they kept giving us new characters. I mean, wound up doing all these different characters. And it really kept you on your toes. I mean, people like Neil Ross and Dan Gilbertson and and all the guys that I work with, and you know, even Frank and, and Pete, you know, it was it was just it was a gas being able to play like that. It was really fun. I mean, don't forget we all worked together. I think I think I did um Peter and I think did uh, Voltron together. Ah, yeah. Like on Transformers? No, no, no. Just I'm saying we did we did other series together. We did you know? I'd run into Pete and I go, "Oh my God, yeah, we just you know, we we wound up doing Voltron together and then did something else." And in fact, we just recently they just did a 50 year anniversary and they called us back in to redo the script. And I think it's going to be on the air sometime soon. And uh, um, what is it? Uh, what's the toy company? Oh, uh, the, the one that owns Transformers? Hasbro. Yeah, Hasbro, yeah. They just called us in. So Frank, myself, Dan Gilderson, Greg Berger. Not, uh, to be, not, to, not to be confused with past guest Greg Berg. Greg Berg, no, totally different guy. And I trained Greg Berg. Oh. You know, I, I took voiceover for, in my early career uh, when I was doing pretty well. And, I, and a lot of my students, um, like Pat Music, who's one of my students, uh, Reese Taylor, um, Neil Ross, uh, Lauren Lester, um, uh, Paul Sloan were Bob Bergen was one of my students. Mm -hmm. Another past guest, Bob Bergen. Of course he was. Yeah, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. almost good. Katsu C was one of my students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. So are you are you working on any besides the uh, Transformers thing that you just mentioned? Are you working on anything new right now that you can talk about that you'd like to I, share? I can't talk about it i just did a game yesterday and mm -hmm. i can't tell you what it is I'm not that's okay it. it's an nda it's a very big game Ooh, it's a wonderful character um and then i got something coming up which i normally do mm -hmm. um i do um Cthum on hearthstone for blizzard mm -hmm. which is which is a, a game and i'll be doing that again this uh, this week mm -hmm. So for video games, like, do you have a different approach to doing video games than you would for like television and film? Always. Well, a, a video game is actually the difference is, is when you're doing a cartoon. If you're okay. doing a show, um, you have a time constraint. You can't have a lot of air in between a thought process. So if you're saying, if the phone rings, you go, hello. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? You have to go, hello, yeah, hi, yeah, how you doing? You can't go, hello, oh, yeah, hi, how you doing? It, it's too much time. You can do that in a video game because it's not about a time constraint because people are working at their own time, their own element, there's no commercials. So if you have a dramatic moment and the character, <clears throat> the character says, um, boy, I really miss... Uh, those days, that was, wow, yeah, that was, whew, that was something. You can do that 
you couldn't do that for an animated show. You'd have mm -hmm. to really condense it because you only have a certain amount of time before the commercial pops in. You have 50 mm -hmm. minutes to show, 50 minutes of commercial. At least that's what I'm told. Okay. So let's wrap it up with a fan question. I ask listeners to send in fan questions. And How many this... fans we got? I got, uh, I got 12 up there? What's happening? <laughs> well, I, I guess we'll see by uh, how many people listen to this one. I mean, like I said, the last one broke yeah. my broke my record, which I'm All still right. amazed by. Let's see if we can get this one to an even bigger record. Uh, but this, right. fan, this fan question comes from somebody by the name of Nicholas Malone. And he wants to know, how did you get the role of Dick Dastardly in the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera? Wow. Okay, Dick. That's because uh, Paul Warner was no longer doing it. Mm -hmm. Paul was Dick Dastardly. Mm -hmm. And like most of us in the wings, uh, you, you always you'd go home and you'd mimic maybe another actor. Or you, you see how he got to that voice, not for the purposes of replacing them, just that I just wonder if I could do that. I wonder if I could do that sound. I wonder if I could do that animal or whatever it is. And um, I listened to Paul enough that I said, well, that's really fun. I'm, I'm able to do that. And I just forgot about it. And then when Paul decided to leave it and not do it anymore, I, they called me in and they said, you know, we heard you playing around sometime. Would you want to give it a shot? And I said, sure. And I did and they gave it to me. So what was do you do you know what it was that got Paul to leave that role and also Gargamel? Sure, Paul. Uh, Paul, as you must know, did uh, Jerry Mahoney. Did Jerry Mahoney? So he had an original show. Mm -hmm. Paul saw Jerry Mahoney. NBC erased all those great tapes. Ooh. He blew a gasket, and he sued them for a couple of mil. And Ooh. so when I heard he was come wasn't coming back uh, specifically for. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, the Smurfs, I called and I said, Paul, I won't do this because they didn't tell me what happened. I won't do the role if it's a, if it's a money issue. If you're asking for more money and they're going to go to me because I can do it, I'm not going to do it. He said, don't worry about it, boy chick. Have a good time. I'm not coming back because I just made a lot of money from NBC and I don't feel like working anymore. <laughs> so you go have a good time. I said, okay, thank you. Hmm. Were, you ever, were you ever asked to do Tigger? No, no, there are. Oh, I think doesn't Jim do Tigger? Yep, Jim Cummings does Tigger. Jim does Tigger? Uh, no, no, no. I was never asked. You no, know, you know, you you don't. You know, I tell you, one of the things I, I wanted to do is that Casey's. You know, I have a voice that's very similar to Casey. Casey, Casey. You know that back thing for a, a Scooby Doo. I never got a shot at it. I really wanted a shot at that because Casey is, it was gone and they were doing more Scooby Doo's. Although I guessed it on Scooby, mm -hmm. I was a guest. I did a lot of Scooby guests. But I wanted to play uh, his character because I, I was imitating him anyway, as it was, because we both have that sound. And they never called me in. Huh. I'm just noticing that you do kind of sound a little bit like Casey. I'm warm, kind of Casey. Hi, it's Casey. Casey I'm over here. You know. Yeah. Welcome to America's Top 40. Welcome to America's Top 40. Yeah. Keep, keep your feet on the ground, but keep reaching for the stars. Or as Shaggy would say, zoinks! Zoink! Yep. I, I, uh, for Halloween, um, it was uh, this past Halloween, of course, was during the SAG after strike. And right. there were a certain there were guests that were supposed to be coming on uh, Nostalgia Talk that had to be put on hold because of the strikes and right. which, which happens. I mean, you know, it's nobody's fault. Um, and so to pass the time, I managed to get a few guests who were not on strike. But I was like, eh, why don't I have some fun with this? So. I did I did a couple of retrospectives on some Halloween related productions and a couple of them were Scooby Doo related and it was pretty easy to imitate Shaggy as I was describing what Shaggy was doing in those. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a good point. I'm told, and I hope he's not listening, but what the hell, what do I care? Um, that the guy who eventually got Shaggy originally came from Minnesota or the Midwest or something. He sent in, they, they did a whole contest. Do you sound like Shaggy? Whatever, and he sounded like him. So they hired him. Mm -hmm. And when he got into the studio, he couldn't act it. He was able to do the voice the way uh, the way uh, he, the way the case yeah, Casey did the voice, but only in the role that Casey played, only with those lines. He mm -hmm. couldn't do he couldn't act. And no. so I think they went, I don't know, I think Frank maybe maybe this 
Is there now? I don't know. I think Shaggy is now done by. They, it's kind of alternated. Uh, Billy West has done Shaggy at one point. Scott Inez has done Shaggy. Yeah. And I think now it's Matthew Lillard, uh, who was was actually Shaggy's human actor in the live action Scooby Doo films. Don't I don't know. I know uh, Billy is sensational. Billy yeah. is, is just great. But I don't know who the others are. It, it just shows they don't lock in. I mean, you know that. I think uh, Bob Burton was Porky for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think they got somebody else to do Porky. At least that's what I was led to believe. Somebody else was doing Donald Duck for a long time. They got somebody else. To, they make choices like that. I mean, that's that's the business. And you, you can't you can't hold them to it. It's what they want to do. It's their choice. Yeah, one of my one one of my past guests was actually that actor of Donald Duck that uh, stepped in for a bit. His name's Daniel Ross. Yeah, well, Dan, Dan's great, and he and he, he is. And that's not a that's not an easy voice to do. The yeah. original Donald Duck, not the original, but the second one, was an artist mm -hmm. at the studio. So they hired an artist to do Donald Duck because he, he was playing around. He said, "Oh yeah, let's get him," and he, and he made a fortune doing it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and yeah, it, it is a hard voice to do. Like, um, I, like Daniel did it for me and I was Im amazed at it's how he, so, yeah. Make it sound clear. Yeah. This is, this, this, this is, this is, this is how, this is how I do Donald. I'm just like, I know that none of the listeners can see it, but I'm kind of like pinching my cheek because I saw Daniel do that. But Wait, it's, it's tough. Does, does he do that? Does he he did it that way. He, he did it that way. Yeah. What? That's oh, part of how he did it. Oh, it's hard. I mean, that I can't do that. There's it's no hard. Way. It's really hard. Yeah, that's 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 hard. That's a hard one. I wouldn't mm -hmm. attempt it. Mm. Well, that's all I've got here. Is there anything you want to yeah. say to wrap up? That's uh, about all. Um, not much. Uh, not much else to to confer on. I'm busy doing. In fact, if anybody's a horror fa fan. Did they watch uh, Troll? Not the Trolls, but Troll on Netflix. It was a Swedish film. I dubbed that. That was fun. It was oh. a huge, massive success. One of the one of the, the the big successes for Netflix foreign films. So I'm getting. I'm having a lot of fun dubbing uh, during dubbing films. That's awesome. Well, and Mike, they, you know, don't forget games Hearthstone, the Blizzard Hearthstone, and I'm Cthulhu. That's it. There's not, nothing else to talk about. So you better have more than a thousand watching this. I guess we'll find out. Uh, well, Michael, thank you very much for coming on Nostalgia Talk today. My pleasure. And to all you listeners out there, up next is episode number 80. That's a big number. Up next, episode number 80. And joining me for that will be Caitlin Robrock, the current voice of Minnie Mouse. And joining me for that, will be Caitlin Roebuck, the current voice of Minnie Mouse. <laughs> Thank you for that, Michael. <laughs> and to all you listeners out there, stay tuned. Peace out.